So folks, my goodness, you're going to see something glorious here. You're going to see old Donnie get destroyed in an absolutely gargantuanly brutal interview. It is one of the roughest things I've ever seen because it's just so clinical how he gets sliced and diced and it goes bad extremely quickly. We have clips of Trump, yes, but we also have him getting wrecked by people in his own party, just absolutely crushing him and many of his goons. This is the greatest Sunday treat I could ever bring you. Frankly, guys, this is one of those times you got to thank me. Hit the like and subscribe button. It really helps me out. And watch all of this. Donnie get torn down. And at the end, Donnie make a massive mistake that screws himself. The other thing to remember about Donald Trump is that he reportedly shared Israeli intelligence with the Russians very early in his term. Uh, he also, as we know now from the indictments that we've seen uh, from, from Jack Smith, uh, shared highly classified military documents apparently relating to a, you know, military action potentially against Iran. He shared that with Mark Meadows' ghostwriters and political consultants, it seems, according to the indictments. So if you think about um, not only is he out there uh, advocating for um, complimenting America's adversaries and, in fact, terrorist organizations that slaughter innocents, um, he also seems to have shared very highly classified intelligence information, both ours and the Israelis, in fact, with adversaries. So I think it's, it's simply the latest example of why Donald Trump is not fit to be president of the United States. Um, who do you think is providing better leadership on the international stage right now, um, Biden or Trump? What we have seen over the course of, you know, the last um, almost uh, three years now since January 6th has been um, almost without exception, almost without exception, the judiciary has just been um, in, just, just stalwart in terms of recognizing and understanding the threat to the republic that's posed by Donald Trump's past behavior, um, by what he did leading up to January 6th, and frankly, what he's continued to do. And, and so I think that it's really important that people recognize the efforts that he's putting in to try to tear down every institution of our democracy. Um, and I think that, that we, have, we, we all need to be very clear about the extent to which the judges and the justices in this country, and I, you know, again, as I said, almost without exception, whether they've been appointed by Democratic presidents or Republican presidents, um, have a very clear understanding of the danger here um, and a very clear understanding and dedication to the rule of law. And, and as a nation, we all ought to be very grateful for that. And we ought to reject the kind of attacks um, that we're seeing, obviously, launched by Donald Trump, but also the kind of lies coming out of Jim Jordan and some other House Republicans, the notion that the entire judiciary system or the, the FBI is weaponized against us. Um, and, and I would urge that people think about as we look at the threats globally, the notion that we've got Republicans saying we're going to defund the FBI, we're going to defund the Department of Justice. Uh, Jim Jordan wants to stop a number of the programs that have kept us safe since 9-11. Um, that is very dangerous, and, and people like that don't understand the threat we face. Like to watch this fiasco play out over the last few weeks. I, I mean, it, it is, uh, it's hard to describe. Um, I wish that it were surprising. Um, you know, what we've seen is a result of really um, the leadership decisions that Kevin McCarthy made all the way back after the 2020 election and certainly after January 6th. And, you know, looking the other way in the face of the kind of assault on our democracy that we've seen uh, from Donald Trump and his allies in the House, including Jim Jordan, elevating uh, those members, um, frankly, uh, some of whom are white supremacists, some of whom are uh, anti-Semitic, um, uh, a number of whom in, were involved directly in the attempt to seize power um, and overturn the election. So it's, it's, it's not a surprise when you see uh, that those people have been empowered, but, but it's also... It's McCarthy really empowered dangerous. them, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, in order to be able to uh, obtain the votes he needed to become speaker. But I also have been, you know, watching the extent to which political violence and the threats of violence have now reared their head once again. You know, those have become part of our politics in a way that, that certainly they never should. Um, I talked to one of my former colleagues who was in the meeting with Jordan and uh, the holdouts a few days ago, 
Uh, and he told me that when some of the members who were receiving these threats of violence raised it and, and asked Jordan about it, uh, that another of our colleagues, Representative Davidson, also from Ohio, said essentially, it's not Jim Jordan's fault, it's your fault because you're voting against Jim Jordan. Mm. Now that kind of um, acceptance of uh, violence uh, is completely um, uh, inappropriate and dangerous in our politics. Um, so I, you know, they, we need people who are serious um, and who recognize and understand the dangers that we're facing globally as well as uh, from Donald Trump and those who support him. What do you think is driving the domestic threats against lawmakers within the Republican Party and also uh, among some Democrats? The domestic threats are absolutely being driven by uh, Donald Trump and, and unfortunately some of his supporters who in fact have encouraged and taken steps that have resulted in, as we saw on January 6th, political violence. When you have a member of Congress reportedly uh, like uh, Warren Davidson from Ohio who in the meeting with Jim Jordan last week, when some of the holdouts raised with Jordan the fact that they were getting death threats, mm -hmm. one of them told me that in response, Congressman Davidson said, well, that's not Jim Jordan's fault, that's your fault for voting against him. That is the kind of encouragement and acceptance of violence that is absolutely, uh, has no place in this party, should it's have no place in our country. It is. You are quoted in the book as saying, a very large portion of my party really doesn't believe in the Constitution. How did you come to that damning conclusion? When former President Trump said we should set aside the Constitution and reappoint him as president, why, you had Republicans cheer that. It's like, wait a second. This is the leader of our party saying we should put aside the Constitution. How can you believe you're following the Constitution if that's the case? You were once the party's nominee, and now you're a pariah in the Republican Party. Yeah, that's, that's saying it in a gentle way. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, no question, I don't really have a home in my party. I come from a tradition of, you know, Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush and John McCain. Those are the people that have shaped our party. Anti-Putin, anti-Russia, anti-authoritarians, anti-Kim Jong-un, character counts. The character of our leaders makes a difference and it shapes the character of our country. That's the party I've come from. And I don't recognize that in the great majority of our party today. And, uh, and that, for me, is very troubling. I, I don't think I've heard a single member of my uh, caucus, the Republicans in the Senate, say, you know, Donald Trump is great. Aren't we lucky to have him as our leader? Donald Trump represents a failure of character, which is changing, I think, in many respects, the psyche of our nation and the heart of our nation. And that's something which takes a long time, if ever, uh, to repair. The most senior lawyers in your own administration and on your campaign told you that after you'd lost more than 60 legal challenges that it was over. Why did you ignore them and decide to listen to a new outside group? Because I didn't respect them. Uh, you'd hired them. Lawyers. Sure, but that doesn't mean, you know, you hire them, you never met these people, you get a recommendation, they turn out to be rhinos or they turn out to be not so good. In many cases, I didn't respect them, but I did respect others. I respected many others I, that, that said the election was rigged. You called some of your outside lawyers. You said they had crazy theories. Why were you listening to them? Were you listening to them because they were telling you what you wanted to hear? You know who I listened to myself? I saw what happened. I watched that election and I thought the election was over at 10 o'clock in the evening. You were listening to your instincts. Uh, my instincts are a big part of it. That's been the thing that's gotten me to where I am, my instincts. But I also listened to people. There are many lawyers. I could give you many books. Uh, I, there are books that are written on how the election was rigged. There are numerous books that were written on how the election was Just rigged. to be clear, were you listening to your lawyer's advice or were you listening to your own instincts? I was listening to different people, and when I added it all up, the election was rigged. There are books were you that calling are written. the shots, though? In fact, Molly Hemingway wrote a great book. Oh, were you called calling rigged. the shots, ultimately? Excuse me. Molly Hemingway, mm -hmm. who's highly respected and great, she wrote a, a book, a, a best selling book called Rigged. Were you calling the shots, though, Mr. President, ultimately? Uh, as to whether or not I believed it was rigged? Oh, sure. I, okay. I, it was my decision, but I listened to some people. Some people said that. Um, like guys like Bill Barr, he was a stiff, but he wasn't there at the time. But he, he didn't do his job because he was afraid. You know what he was afraid of? He was afraid of being impeached. He was petrified to be impeached. And he's, how do you not get impeached? Don't do anything. Um, when will you make a decision about whether you want to run for president of the United States. 
Well, what I am doing uh, right now, what I will continue to do is very much focus on making sure that we get people elected at all levels who are serious, people who believe in the Constitution. I think we're at a moment in this nation where we certainly have seen we face significant threats internationally. We've got Iran, Russia, North Korea, China arrayed against us. Yeah. This is a threat atmosphere that we have not seen certainly since the end of World War II. Bob Gates said ever, right? but, but yes, also said right. there's no presidential alternative in terms of a affirmative vision for America's role in the world. Have you heard any candidates for president offer that vision? Uh, I think that certainly you have seen some. Um, I think that it needs to be a much louder, uh, we need a much louder voices within both parties, within my own party. I don't even know how I should call it my own party. Within the Republican Party right now, the extent to which you're seeing people suggest that we should abandoned Ukraine, uh, which essentially is surrendering in this battle between freedom and, and tyranny. Uh, and, and that would be very dangerous for our security. So, folks, this is a big deal. And that last clip was a one that was held over. There were deleted parts of that old interview, but it was just kind of like reemerging today where Trump makes a massive legal mistake, right? Where he says, among other things, um, that he fundamentally did it all himself, but on the other hand was listening to his lawyers. Right? His defense has been, I couldn't do anything wrong because I was listening to counsel and my counsel was wrong, but there he just said it was his entire plan. And that one particular clip was something that's reemerged. But you can see in the rest of it, like all these Republicans, and I don't think these are good people. I don't. I'm not going to defend them. They've made some honorable decisions in isolation, but their policy choices are by and large bad, as is the romanticization of the pre-Trump GOP. But they are right in saying that, you know, even, even if they're wrong, that the pre-Trump GOP was this great thing, they are correct that it's morphed into something even more disgusting than what existed before. Reaganism was not good. Trumpism doesn't happen without Reaganism. And yet there are particular aspects to what we see today that make Donald Trump and his movement uniquely dangerous, even in the context of the American insane right. And these interviews, Trump's own words, but also these others, destroy him better than almost anything else could. It, in many ways, Republicans attacking Trump approach it with a sort of uh, vision that makes it clear just how dangerous he is.